friends join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. When I was asked to preach today and saw that one of the lessons was to be Elijah under the broom tree, I said, yes, I will take August 12th. I would love to preach on August 12th because I love Elijah under the broom tree. And Jeremy just did the sermon for me. <laughs> that was really beautifully sung. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, in in what I have to say, keep in mind the music we've heard. Keep in mind this aria with its two contrasting emotions. Keep in mind the opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision, Lord of My Heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Keep in mind our middle hymn, Drop thy still dues until all our struggles be imitators of God. That's the task that Paul sent out for the young church at Ephesus. Be imitators of God. And so begins the long history of a struggle that we are in today. The effort to imitate the inimitable. It is so much easier to be imitation gods than to be imitations of God. I know how much simpler life is when I just think of myself as good rather than pushing myself to be good, to speak good, to do good in the world. The instruction Paul gives to the young church is so simply said be angry, but do not let the sun go down on your anger. Put away bitterness and slander. Be kind to one another. Forgive. But how difficult it is to really live out these simple instructions, and how easy it is in trying to live them out for us to reach the end of our rope, the end of our patience, the limits of our love for one another. The struggle to imitate God can wear us out, and we are in very good company. Once upon a time, there was a great and powerful voice that was raised against the powers of the world. That voice belonged to the man Elijah, or Eliyah. Was that really his name? I mean, did his friends call him that at school? We don't know. We can't know for sure. We do know and the reason we might suspect it isn't his real given name, is that his name has a meaning in Hebrew. Eli Yah, my God, is Yah, Yahweh. And that, Eli Yah, was not only his name, but the message of his prophetic life. Against the powerful in his land of Israel, he raised his voice to say, Do not you forget God, who brought you out of slavery into this land. The God of Abraham and Moses, whose people you are, do not forget who you are and whose you are. And having raised that cry, Elijah left the country for a while and was cared for in the wild foreign lands by a widow and fed by ravens. It's that kind of story. But soon he was brought back to Israel by God and raised his voice again, calling for a direct test the prophets of the local god Baal, against his god, Israel's god, Yahweh. And he won that contest. After calling for the death of the false prophets, Elijah found himself under a death sentence from the Queen Jezebel. And that is what brought him at the start of today's little reading, to his dark night, under the broom tree, in the wilderness, in the aria from the oratorio Elijah that Jeremy just sang for us, you heard from that reading his first prayer, it is enough. But then in the middle of it, you heard him say, God, 
I've done everything you have asked me to do. I've proven that you are God, and still my life is under a death sentence. Now a broom tree grows in Middle Eastern deserts. It grows here and there, a solitary tree. It's only about 10 feet high, so it's really more of a big shrub than a small tree. But it has a spreading crown, and since it grows as an oasis tree, it casts a very needed and welcome shade in the desert and makes a comfortable shelter. The branches make excellent firewood for cooking, and the coals stay hot for a very long time. And so it's a useful tree to find on your way through the desert. Elijah makes a simple enough prayer. It's enough. I've had it, he says. I've worn myself out doing what was right, doing what I was called to do, and even success has only brought me more trouble, more weariness. And now, and now, O oh Lord, he prays, take away my life. It is enough. And Elijah lies down, ready to die, under that solitary tree. Do we have any reason to think that Elijah's prayer was not sincere? Or to think he wouldn't have found peace had he been released from his life's labors that very night? But instead, he wakens twice in the night to find a ministering angel with white bread and water, who speaks of the journey ahead and urges him on his way. What lies ahead after 40 days and 40 nights wandering to Mount Horeb is an encounter with the living God, the well-known episode. On Mount Horeb, Elijah is awakened by a fire, but God is not in the fire. By a great rush of wind, and God is not in the wind. By an earthquake, but God is not in the earthquake. And then, the still, small voice. Of calm. Elijah's prayer made a direct request of God. Finish it now. I'm done. God's answer in that darkest night seems to have been, no you ain't. But God didn't stop there. That would have really been the last straw for Elijah to hear, no you're not done yet from God. Rather, God sent what was needed, food, rest, strength, and perhaps most of all, a presence that assured Elijah that God was his God and was with him still in the dark under that broom tree shelter. As the psalmist said, this poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. Meanwhile, a thousand years later, and somewhat to the south, once upon a time there was a great and powerful voice that was raised against the powers of the world. This voice belonged to Jesus, or rather, Yeshua. His name means Yah saves, Yahweh saves. And that was the message of his prophetic life. Against the powerful in his land, he raised his voice to say, Do not forget the God who brought you out of slavery and into this land, the God of Abraham and Moses, whose people you are. Do not forget who you are and whose you are. Like Elijah before him, at the beginning of his labors, Jesus went out into the wilderness and began to practice living in the hands of God. But soon he was brought back by God to Jerusalem and raised his voice again, making a direct challenge to the authorities, particularly the religious authorities. And that is what brought him to his own dark night under the trees in Gethsemane. And there he made a simple enough prayer. My soul is so full of sorrow, even to death. I've had it, Jesus says. I've worn myself out doing what was right, doing what I was called to do, and these good works have only brought me more trouble, more weariness. And now, and now, Father, he prays, seeing what is ahead on the path, 
if there is any way it can be done, take away this bitter cup. Yet he adds something. He adds something Elijah didn't know. A new prayer to change the dimension of Elijah's old prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus still has a journey ahead. But rather than a journey to the mountaintop, it will be the road to the hill of Golgotha, to the cross. Even though he cannot feel God's presence, the voice is that small, that still. He cries out, why have you abandoned me? Still he maintains that connection with his last breath saying, into your hands I commend my spirit. And as with Elijah a thousand years before, God then lifts Jesus up past exhaustion and renews his life. As the psalmist said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Meanwhile, two thousand years into the future, one strong voice was raised against the National Socialist Party from the very beginning of its long buildup of power and control in Germany between the wars. The voice of theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In every way he could see possible, he tried to keep the church faithful to following Christ as its head, its only true leader, even while Hitler, der Führer, the leader, claimed more and more to be head of the German churches in order to use them for his own political ends. When the national church elections were hijacked by the Nazi movement, Baumgartner went to serve for a few years in German churches of London, writing, it was about time to go for a while to the desert. Then he returned with new vigor to confront the regime in Germany. Now earlier he had spent a year at Union Theological Seminary in New York City teaching Sunday school at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. While he was offered a way out of the trouble ahead by returning to Union in 1939, he wrote instead, I would have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I did not share the trials of this time with my people. He worked during the war as a double agent in military intelligence and was eventually arrested and imprisoned along with his fellow anti-Nazi resistors who had plotted against, the, uh, the Hitler, uh, against Hitler's life. He was executed in April of 1945, just a few weeks before the U.S. Army marched in to liberate the camp where he had been held. Bonhoeffer wrote this hymn, his last, for New Year's Eve 1944, looking ahead to a new year that he knew he had no chance of surviving. By gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered, and confidently waiting come what may, we know that God is with us night and morning, and never fails to greet us each new day. Yet is this heart by its old foe tormented, still evil days bring burdens hard to bear. Oh, give our frightened souls the sure salvation for which, O oh Lord, you taught us to prepare. And when this cup you give is filled to brimming with bitter suffering, hard to understand, we take it thankfully and without trembling, out of so good and so beloved a hand. Yet when again in this same world you give us the joy we had, the brightness of your Son, we shall remember all the days we lived through, and our whole life shall then be yours alone. Our whole life, the bright days and the dark nights, God is with us, come what may. Bonhoeffer understands the stories of Elijah of Jesus, of Paul <coughs> from prison, well enough to know that God is present night and morning after night. By gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered, he wrote, even while he sat in a concentration camp in the bitter cold of late December 1944, 
echoing the faith of the psalmist. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Two weeks ago, Reverend Wilson stood at this pulpit and preached in part about the danger of letting the extraordinary tragedies and suffering of our lives, of our times, become ordinary, become acceptable, become commonplace. And not one week later, another name of another mass murderer was added to the list, to the point where I no longer can tell when the news story comes on which murderer they're talking about, which tragedy they're referring to. It takes a while to orient myself. And into that world, we hear a response, which is the response built out of faith and confidence in the presence of God. Vahi Guru, Vahi Guru, Vahi Guru, I heard on the radio yesterday at the memorial service that was at the, for the victims from the Sikh temple. That's the Guru Mantra, the mantra of God. And one line of that mantra I turned into our call to worship. This is a Sikh prayer. God, you set me free with the shining light of awesome wonder. Sitting down, standing up, while I sleep, while I wake, when I eat, when I breathe, let me never forget you. You set me free with shining light of awesome wonder. Now I've taken that prayer from their religious texts, which was echoed immediately by our religious text, Be Thou My Vision, Waking or Sleeping, Thy Presence, My Life. To say, the same God who is present in their lives now, in the midst of tragedy, is present in our lives now, was present with Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the concentration camp, was present with Paul in the Roman prison, was present with Jesus on the cross and in Gethsemane, and was present with Elijah under that solitary broom tree. We, who are members of the body of Christ, have been given this charge, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. In the passage leading up to this commission, Paul details what it means to be imitators of God. And if you haven't tried it already, I'll tell you my take on it. It isn't easy. It wears you out. You get to the end of your rope, frustrated, anxious, angry, weary to the depths of your soul, fearful for the future. That's when we need, that's when I need, to take what is offered, to taste and to see that the Lord is good. That's when I need, that's when we need, to come to rest in the shade and be refreshed in the wilderness. May God give us that grace today and always.